Hi, in the last section we did a tour of the Julia language without getting too deep into the it's a bitsy details. We did touch upon the Julia type system. For instance, you now know there are different types like numbers, strings, arrays, and dictionaries, and that Julia has the concept of type annotations. But we didn't go much beyond that. In this section, we'll look at the type system in depth. This is a pretty cool topic because it's really what makes Julia unique. Unlike object-oriented languages like C++, Java, or Python, Julia doesn't provide any sort of class hierarchy where behavior and data gets bundled together. You will probably find it a bit alien in the start and wonder, why did they do it like this? The goal of this section is to get you to understand how the Julia type system is different, why it's like that, and what the benefits of it is. Let's move to the first video in this section where we'll get into the bread and butter of how we can inspect types and objects and learn things about them, like about the supertypes and subtypes of particular objects. You've probably already seen me use the type of function multiple times. For instance, to learn the type of an integer literal. What you might not have occurred to you is that I can actually store the type as an object into a variable. So if types can be stored in a variable and are objects, then they should also have a type. And that turns out it's called a data type. Now you might wonder like how deep does the rabbit hole go? What would be the type of a type? So if I do a data type and do the type of that. So you can see that it just there's a limit to how meta meta this gets. Some languages will make this very complicated, but Julia doesn't get completely overboard with its theoretical concepts. Because types are objects, we can of course use them as arguments to functions to find out more about them. For instance, it's super type. So I'm going to store in B the super type of A. So the super type of a 64 bit integer is signed, which makes sense because if I did the super type of a uint 64, I'll get an unsigned. Now, what is the super type of B? Well, it's an integer. And we, of course, we can go the other direction. So I can ask for the subtypes of C. So I get a whole array that shows that there are four different subtypes in array. I have big integers. They can hold integers of arbitrary size, uh, booleans, signed and unsigned. But where does it end? Assume we don't know how deep the type hierarchies are could just guess on an upper limit of say 10 and then we'll just iterate forward so let's just start with a type i'm going to start with the type of 4 the in 64 and then we're going to iterate uh, with i from 1 to 10 and then i'm going to successively replace a with its super type and print it out. So we can see as expected, uh, we had the super type that was signed as we saw earlier, and which and the super type of sign is integer, and then we get to real and number, and then finally we get to the top, which is any. And the super type of any is any. So we get a recursive behavior similar to what we saw with data type. Let's try to find out what the type hierarchy is like beginning at the top. To be able to do that, we first have to know where to stop, like not go further down. To experiment a little bit and figure that out, I'm going to do the 
subtype of int 64. So you can see that gives us an empty array. So that makes it easy to know when to stop. Okay, I'm almost ready to start writing a function to inspect the, uh, the whole hierarchy. But I'm going to do one more detour. Do you remember how we could concatenate using the multiplication symbol? Now, if we're doing several multiplications of the same thing, in mathematics, you could use the power of. And it turns out that that actually also works with strings. So if I'm doing x to power 3, I get x repeated three times. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, I want to be able to decide on an indentation level when printing a type hierarchy. So I'm going to create this function, show type tree that will take a type that we want to show the type tree below and we'll have a variable to keep track of the indentation level that we want to make it look nice visually. And here is where we're going to use our newfound knowledge. So I'm using the power of the level. So we get an indentation before we print out the name of the type. Now we can iterate over each of the subtypes of T. Now I could just start printing um, the subtypes by using the show type 3 and doing this recursively. But to be on the safe side, I want to make a check. I want to make sure that we're not hitting on any because any would have an awful lot of types that I don't want to print out. And now I can write show type tree. Let's just do a completion so I make sure that I write this. Actually, I can't do that. T, and then we have to increase the level by one. Okay, let's try that and see what the type tree of number is, or the type hierarchy of number. Surprising, we have complex and real numbers immediately below number, and then real is further subdivided into all the different floating point numbers, or the and integers and then we have irrational and rational numbers so remember irrational numbers was our pi and euler and rational rational numbers we get when we're using a denominator and the denominator show type tree show the type tree of abstract um, abstract string so the, the string we're usually using is this one, string. But we can have others. So if you're taking a substring of string, we're getting actually a special type so that we can save memory by only pointing into this one. If we do a show type tree of, let's see, and a range, you can see it doesn't really have anything below it. So. I'm mainly showing you this function so that because we're going to be using it in later videos to learn more about type systems. So let's look at other ways of inspecting types. When discussing UTF-8 strings, we used the size off function to say look at a string. You can see that the ABC contains three bytes. So this is different from length, which would give us the number of characters. Size of is very generic, so I can use that also to inspect any other type. I can do the size of 3, and if you remember from earlier, 3 
thus defaulting, or a number literal will default to 64-bit integer, which is the same as 8 bytes. So if I was specific and I wrote in 16, when creating the 3, I will get that contains 2. We don't even need to specify objects directly uh, because types are objects themselves. We can work with them directly and write size of an in 8 or 16 or 32. We can even go all the way up to 128. Uh, or we can look at the floating point versions. Maybe you're curious what is the size of a bool because in theory that could be a single bit, but it turns out it's a byte. And actually it is a byte, I think, in most programming languages. Now let's do something interesting. All the types I looked at now have been at the bottom of the type hierarchy. So what is Julie going to say if I try to get the size of an integer? This type doesn't specify whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit. So it turns out that doesn't work. We get an error message that says that the argument is an abstract type. So there's a difference in Julie between concrete types and abstract types. And the concrete types are the types at the leaves of the type hierarchy, and the others are abstract types. We have even more ways that we can peek and poke at types. Uh, for instance, for those who are used to object-oriented terminology, the objects have member variables. In Julia, we'll call them fields. So I can look up the field names. If I actually do a tab complete here, you can see there's a whole bunch of things you can do with field. But let's just do field names of, uh, let's just do 5 to 8. Now, you can remember you can do a stepping, so you can't see a step variable here or a, a step field. So, what happens if I add in a step? How would that look? So, that might look a bit funny. Why would there be different number of fields? Well, it turns out if I'm checking the type of 5 to 8 and one with a step. They're actually different types. This one is a unit range and this one is a, a step range. So now that we know the field names, we can actually access those. So if I take uh, this one, I can get the, uh, the start field or the step or the stop. And the reason why this is not 8 is because if we're stepping with 2, then the last index, or the, the last value will be 7. Of course, this isn't always a practical way to work with types. To just show you why, I'm going to create a dictionary. I'm going to create my standard dictionary where we're mapping some uh, string names for numbers to the corresponding integer numbers. If I do the type of this dictionary, um, if I do the um, field names of this dictionary, you can see it has quite a lot of fields. And some of them, of course, can be useful. I like to know that there are three elements and you can look at the values or the keys but this isn't very well you can see that you can get the values and you can get the keys but you have a whole bunch of stuff in between so obviously this isn't something you're meant to work with directly this exposes a lot of implementation details which is why it's a good practice in Julia to not access fields directly. 
So just like in object-oriented programming, you're going to use functions to support encapsulation. So if we're going to access um, this range, rather than doing first, sorry, start to get the beginning of the range, we can use the first function and we can use last to get the end of the range or step to get the step value so of course in this case we're not really providing a step so we'll default to two but so it's a one sorry let's summarize what we learned in this video i taught you some different ways of peeking and poking at types by using functions such as super type subtype field names and size of we saw how Types themselves are also first-class objects in the language, which allows us to inspect and find out more things about types using functions.